Doug Engelbart is widely credited as the inventor of the computer mouse. Of course, as with most inventions, nothing happened in a vacuum, and before the device that gave birth to the modern mouse was thought up, there were several exceptionally similar devices around. For the full story of the invention of the computer mouse, we'll begin by backtracking slightly to a British engineer whose invention was subsequently classified as a military secret and hidden from the public. That engineer was Professor Ralph Benjamin, who, while working for the Royal Navy Scientific Service, invented a device that functioned in an almost identical fashion to the trackball mouse. He did this way back in the 1940s. According to a 2013 interview with Dr. Benjamin, he was tasked by the Royal Navy with helping develop something called the Comprehensive Display System, an early computer system that could calculate the theoretical trajectory of monitored aircraft based on the inputs of a user. The cursor on the screen was controlled by a simple joystick mechanism that Benjamin felt could be improved upon. After some tinkering, he came up with something he dubbed the Rollerball, which functioned almost identically to a standard mechanical mouse, with an outer ball that would in turn manipulate two rubber-coated wheels inside, one for the x-axis and one for the y. This movement was then translated into the appropriate movement of the cursor on the screen. So why didn't people say the good professor invented the mouse? Beyond that it wasn't Benjamin's device that gave birth to the modern mouse, rather than have the desk or whatever object move the ball via friction as one moves the mechanical mouse, in Benjamin's device, your hand simply directly moved the ball itself with the top of the device exposing said ball. Essentially, it was a large upside down stationary mechanical mouse. Although Benjamin's device was more precise than a joystick, it was never widely implemented and the comprehensive display system continued to be controlled by said joystick. Due to its status as a military secret, Benjamin received little to no credit for the invention of essentially a trackball mouse, and he remained an obscure figure in computing history, despite the innovative nature of the device he pioneered. A similar device was also developed independently of Benjamin's design in 1952 by a company, Ferranti Canada, working as contractors for the Canadian Defense Research Board. The company was, amongst other things, tasked with creating an input device for computers on a budget of basically zero dollars. Three engineers working for Ferranti, Tom Cranston, Fred Longstaff, and Kenyon Taylor came up with the idea of using a ball housed in a casing that remained in constant contact with four wheels positioned around it. When the ball was rolled in a given direction, the movement of the wheels would be translated to corresponding cursor movements on the screen. Essentially, this was a four-wheeled version of Benjamin's device. As a testament to the low budget the engineers had to work with, rather than constructing a trackball from scratch, they simply used a 16-centimeter, about 6-inch, diameter 5-pin bowling ball. Because the device was invented for the military, it too was designed in secret. Ironically, in one notable way, these and other similar trackball devices that were invented before the mouse were more similar to the once ubiquitous ball version of a mechanical mouse than Doug Engelbart's first mouse. You see, Engelbart's mouse didn't use a ball at all, instead having two perpendicular wheels directly contact the table instead of using a ball to manipulate said wheels. While still functional, Engelbart's design had the downside of making it so one wheel was always at least partially being scraped along the surface of the desk. But we're getting ahead of ourselves a little. Engelbart developed what is the direct ancestor of the modern mouse in the 1960s as a part of an ongoing project to discover the most efficient way to interact with the computer. Engelbart felt that the current devices in use at the time, mainly keyboards, joysticks, and light pens, were inefficient. With the help of engineer Bill English, who designed the actual hardware for the first mouse based on Engelbert's idea, he developed a handheld device that housed two perpendicular wheels, the movements of which would control the on-screen cursor. Essentially, this more or less worked like an upside-down handheld version of the two previously mentioned stationary trackball devices, but without the ball. Engelbart thought up the idea of this device in 1961. The first prototype was created by English in 1964, and in 1966, Engelbart and English approached NASA asking them to fund a study to determine which input device was the most intuitive and efficient for controlling a cursor. According to Engelbart, the devices proposed to be tested, besides the mouse, were the light pen, tracking ball, and slider on a pivot. The space agency agreed and a series of tests were carried out. Engelbart noted of the tests, we set up our experiments and the mouse won in every category. Even though it had never been used before by the test subjects, it was faster and with it, people made fewer mistakes. Five or six of us were involved in these tests, but no one can remember who started calling it a mouse. I'm surprised the name stuck. 
Ingobart later explained it was called a mouse due to the fact that initially they had the wire come out of the bottom like a little tail. They switched it to the top to get around one's arm getting tangled in the cord all the time. This brings us to the Fall Joint Computer Conference in San Francisco on December 9th, 1968. Engelbart presented this mouse to over 1,000 computer engineers in one of the most influential computing presentations of all time, later dubbed the mother of all demos. Besides the mouse, Engelbart and his colleagues also demonstrated in one system a number of revolutionary concepts that are now a staple of modern computing, including hypertext, video conferencing via a high-speed modem, shared screens via network where control could be passed back and forth, Fourth, a form of windowed computing, word processing, real-time digital text editing with multiple people able to edit files at the same time with revision control, and several other forms of network collaboration. Further, at a time when the idea of a personal computer was a little outlandish, he also demoed how such a system would be used for various personal computing needs, like maintaining a grocery list with robust organizational features built into the word processor to manage such lists. Before the presentation, some who'd heard of what Engelbart was working on had dubbed him a crackpot. After the presentation, Engelbart received a standing ovation and was described by later Xerox Park employee Chuck Thacker as dealing lightning in both hands. However, demonstrating a system amazingly far ahead of its time left some skeptics that his team's online system, NLS developed with funding from DARPA, could actually do what they demonstrated. One such individual was famed computer scientist Andreas Van Dam, who furiously berated Engelbart after the presentation, stating, It's irresponsible and unethical for you to show something you put together for a demo and pretend it actually works. To which Engelbart stated, No, I told him it's real. He just wouldn't believe it until he got to SRI and saw it for himself. Despite very publicly debuting the mouse to the best minds of the computing world in 1968, Engelbart's part in its invention and even the monumental presentation itself that greatly influenced so much of the coming decades of computer development were largely forgotten. And so it was that like so many other inventors before him, Engelbart did not receive the credit for his invention initially, and Bill English even still receives little credit to this day. This despite the fact that several years later English would go on to invent the mechanical mouse that featured a ball to control the XY wheels, which would become the general design of just about all mice until the rise of things like optical mice. Beyond receiving little credit, because Engelbart and English were working for Stanford Research Institute when they developed the first mouse, the eventual patent that was granted for it in 1970 didn't belong to them. Thus, the pair got no money for their invention other than their normal paychecks. Stanford Research Institute reportedly did make some money off the patent before it expired in 1984. For instance, reportedly profiting four $40,000, about $130,000 today, when they licensed it to Apple. Speaking of Apple, the mouse as we know it today rose from obscurity thanks to Steve Jobs being Steve Jobs, i.e. finding an existing technology, hiring someone to copy it, but with very subtle usability tweaks, geniusly marketing it, and then later getting much of the credit for it. In this case, in 1979, Jobs agreed to give Xerox a certain number of Apple shares in exchange for allowing him to come see what Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, Park, was working on. When Jobs went on a tour of the research center, he encountered a prototype version of the mouse, the ball mechanical mouse invented by Bill English, who was now working for Xerox Park. Jobs recognized the potential of the device immediately, and according to Larry Tesler, the engineer who demonstrated the mouse to Jobs, he, Jobs, was very excited. Then, when he began seeing the things I could do on screen, he watched for about a minute and started jumping around the room shouting, why aren't you doing anything with this? This is the greatest thing. This is revolutionary. As it turned out, Xerox was doing something with the device and had been selling the Xerox Alto along with the trackball mouse since 1973 and would later package it with the Xerox 8010 released in 1981. However, higher ups in the company didn't seem to properly appreciate how innovative their system was. As Jobs would later note, if Xerox had known what it had and had taken advantage of its real opportunities, it could have been as big as IBM, plus Microsoft, plus Xerox combined, and the largest high technology company in the world. Jobs, stunned at the sheer lack of vision, rushed back to Apple and had his team developing the next iteration of the company's personal computer line completely revamp their plans, demanding a window-based system with the mouse as a key component. According to Dean Hovey, Jobs explained to him later that week, the Xerox mouse is a mouse that costs $300 to build and it breaks within two weeks. Here's your design spec. Our mouse needs to be manufactured for less than 15 bucks, which is about $50 today. It needs to not fail for a couple years and I want to be able to use it on a Formica and my blue jeans. 
Hovey then explained, from that meeting, I went to Walgreens and I wandered around and bought all the underarm deodorants that I could find because they had the ball in them. I bought a butter dish for the body of the mouse. That was the beginnings of the apple mouse. As for why the apple mouse only had one button, unlike other mice of the day, for instance, the original had three buttons, which after much research, Engelbart and his team determined was the ideal number, Hovey stated there were disputes around the number of buttons. Three buttons, two buttons, one button mouse. The mouse at Xerox had three buttons but we came around that learning to mouse is a feat in and of itself, and to make it as simple as possible with just one button was pretty important. Apple's first take on the mouse came bundled with a relatively obscure Apple Lisa computer. This was named after Jobs' daughter, who he denied was his until 1987, despite that a paternity test confirmed Lisa was his daughter, and she and her mother were living in poverty, all while he simultaneously was naming Apple Lisa after her. The first Apple mouse featured a steel ball to drive the internal tracking wheels. The design was over hauled once again, notably using a rubber ball for the more popular Apple Macintosh computer released in 1984, which became one of the first commercially successful devices to make use of the mouse. Microsoft also came out with their own mouse in 1983 for the PC, which was in between Apple Lisa and the much more famous Macintosh 128K, but it was the latter that subsequently spurred the widespread adoption of the mouse. After the success of the Macintosh, other companies followed suit and the mouse became a staple of the personal computer. Despite many at various times over the decades since predicting that the mouse would go the way of the dodo any day now, most recently because of the rise of the popularity of touchscreens, the mouse is still going strong with seemingly no real end in sight. Speaking of no real end in sight, the QWERTY keyboard. But where did this seemingly random construction of letters on a typing surface come from? And is it true that one of the world's most popular alternatives, the device Vorak keyboard is actually superior. The origin of the keyboard starts, unsurprisingly, with the first typewriters. There were a variety of typewriter-like devices around going back all the way to the 18th century, before one Christopher Latham Scholes, with some help from a few other guys, came up with the one that would become the first commercially successful typewriter in the 1870s. Much like many typewriters since, Scholes' device used letters and characters on the ends of rod, which were called type bars. When the key was struck, the type bar would swing up and hit the ink-coated tape, which would transfer the image onto the paper. The difference between this and more modern incarnations, however, is this first device more or less mimicked the layout of a piano keyboard and positioned the keys in alphabetical order in those two rows. This arrangement had a number of problems, but most notably, as people got faster at typing, it caused the type bars of the most commonly used combination letters of the alphabet to be positioned close together. So when the keys were hit one right after the other, at any fast speed, the keys would jam. To solve this, the keys were rearranged to put commonly used consecutive letters further away from each other to reduce jams. While you might be thinking, and it is widely claimed, this was to fix the problem via making people type slower, all evidence point to this simply being to position the arms of these letters better so they'd be less likely to cross. It should be noted here that you'll often read nowadays that this whole jamming story is also a myth and that Scholes was simply trying to cater to telegraph operators' usage in making the change. Everyone claiming this, including the Smithsonian Magazine, which normally does a lot better research, cites one 2011 paper on the prehistory of QWERTY by Koichi and Motoko Yasuka of Kyoto University as their source. However, what the people parroting this fail to mention is that if you go actually read the paper, as we're wont to do when researching, this paper is just speculation with no real direct evidence to back their claims up. The authors of the paper further incorrectly state that the idea that this is a type bar jamming as motivation didn't pop up until the 1980s. In truth, the idea that the change was spurred by the type bar jamming came about in the 1923 in the book The History of the Typewriter, developed by authors from the Herkimer Historical Society. So what was their source for this claim? None other than Scholl's notes and many correspondence concerning the development of the typewriter. Now, normally we'd then go and actually read through said notes and letters to find where Scholl's actually said this to verify for ourselves, but in this case, while the letters and notes still exist, they only seem to exist in the state archives of Madison, Wisconsin, and unfortunately we don't exactly have the budget to send someone out there to verify. So that's where we had to stop on this particular rabbit hole. If anyone from Madison, Wisconsin wants to go do a little digging further for us and then leave a comment below, 
we'd be much obliged. In the meantime, given the authors here aren't likely to have made this jamming story up out of thin air, and were using Scholl's notes and letters as the basis of their work, it seems probable that jamming really was the motivation for the change. Whether you're on board with us on that one or not, one thing the aforementioned 2011 paper did get right was once it was clear a change was needed to stop the jamming, Scholl's really did work with telegraphists on the final layout to try to cater to their needs as best he could. But this shouldn't be much of a surprise given that these were among his first customers. In fact, his literal first sale of the 1868 model was to Porter's Telegraph College in Chicago. In any event, in 1868, in collaboration with several other people, Scholl settled on an arrangement of letters on the keyboard for better spacing between popular keys used in combination. The result was that this initially made it difficult for people to find the letters they needed to type efficiently, unlike when the letters were in alphabetical order. However, thanks to less likelihood of jamming, once one became proficient in the new layout, it was found to be a much faster typing experience. Of course, at this point in history, people were still predominantly using the hunt and peck method rather than 10 finger typing, so nobody was blazing fast or anything. As for this keyboard though, it was the beginning of some semblance of the QWERTY we know and love today, which first appeared in 1872, though it wasn't quite exactly the one we have yet. For that, we have to fast forward ever so slightly. The first more widely available typewriter machine found its way on the market in 1874 through Remington and Sons. The device was called the Remington No. 1, or sometimes the Scholes and Glidden typewriter, with Remington and Sons acquiring the rights to it and its near QWERTY keyboard. This, however, did not sell well. Four years later though, after slight modifications to the arrangement of the keyboard were made, we finally have the QWERTY layout in the famed Remington & Sons Remington No. 2 model, which also notably included the ability to type both capital and lowercase letters by using the shift key. And if you've ever wondered why the shift key is called that, well wonder no more. The shift key received its name because it caused the carriage to shift positions in order to type either a lowercase or capital letter which were on the same type bar. Although the shift key we use on our keyboards today does not cause the machine to shift mechanically, the name stuck. In any event, as the typewriter rose in popularity, people stopped complaining about the weird arrangement of keys and started memorizing the keyboard and learning how to type efficiently. What particularly helped the sales of the Remington No. 2 model was that Remington Remington offered classes for a very small fee to learn to type proficiently with the keyboard. They also offered certification in the keyboard, which was a good thing to have for a typist looking for a job, and further good for companies wanting to ensure they could get someone proficient right away just by their resume. Within a little over a decade, there were over 100,000 typewriters using this QWERTY layout. As it came to dominate, although other alternate keyboards tried to break into the market, most people decided to stay with the QWERTY layout largely due to the widespread popularity of the typewriters that used it. The nail in the coffin to other layouts occurred in 1893 when Remington and four other major typewriter makers all merged and set the QWERTY as the industry standard. There is one other layout, however, that over the decades has had a small amount of traction and induced many a flame war on the interwebs, often touted as superior to the QWERTY for many reasons, the Dvorak layout. This has its origins in the 1930s when Professor August Dvorak of Washington State University set out to develop a more user-friendly keyboard. He ultimately changed the layout such that all of the vowels and the five most commonly used consonants were arranged on the home row. The general idea of this keyboard to minimize the need to use your fingers as much as possible when typing commonly used words. For example, with the Dvorak keyboard, a person could type approximately 400 of the English language's most commonly words just by using the keys of the home row, compared to in the ballpark of only 100 of the most common words on the QWERTY keyboard. It is also optimized such that you'll more frequently alternate hands pressing the keys to further increase speed. So does this actually speed up typing? No, not in any real world noticeable way. It turns out in the countless studies done on this, the general consensus seems to be that the average increase in word per minute is typically only about 2% to up to 10% or so, give or take depending on what study you want to go with. So for example, if you used to type at 60 words per minute, you might expect something like at most 66 words per minute or so once you take the necessary time to become proficient at the new arrangement. That said, some people see much higher improvement rates, even sometimes on the order of 30% to 100% boost in words per minute rates. 
However, if you look closer, people that see these type of huge improvements tend to be people that learned to type on the QWERTY keyboards without any formal training and generally had suboptimal speeds there because of it. Thus, if they trained properly on the QWERTY keyboard, they'd also have seen a large increase in words per minute. As you might imagine from this, actually testing which is superior, if either, has been a bit difficult given there's potential for a lot of noise in the data with so many people at so many varied levels of proficiency on the QWERTY before being formally trained on the Dvorak. Thus, in an effort to get around this problem, there have been studies that have taken the humans out of the experiment. Exhibit A, a January of 2006 paper titled The Great Keyboard Debate, QWERTY vs. Dvorak by Kathleen Hempstock of the University of Waikato. In this study, she measured things like the average travel time it took for fingers to move up and down rows and press and the like for a given strokes on the keyboard. She then took 21 lengthy books, including Moby Dick, and simply added up the time it would take to type those texts out using the Dvorak and the QWERTY layouts, given the known average movement times for proficient typers. An ingeniously simple and accurate way to take out the human. So what were the results? Timing-wise, even with such a large sample size, neither keyboard was really faster than the other in the general case. She summed up the study by stating, The Dvorak layout is the most efficient because it requires the least amount of effort to type some given text, even though it takes approximately the same amount of time as the QWERTY layout. At this point, you aficionados might be already heading to the comments to tell us that the Dvorak's initial studies, particularly ones conducted with the U.S. Navy in 1944, looking at this keyboard's superiority showed far more glowing results in increased speeds, a whopping 74% increase and reduction of typos by 68% once the keyboardist was trained up. The problem was that the follow-up studies, such as the one by U.S. General Services Administration in 1953, among others around this time, couldn't replicate these results, though some speculate these studies were rigged against the Dvorak. Whether that's true or not, a surprising number of studies since, as noted, haven't been able to replicate the original results either, except in cases where someone hadn't bothered to be properly trained in the QWERTY layout in the first place. Whatever you want to believe on whether the 1950s studies were rigged or not, these studies ultimately killed the Dvorak keyboard's momentum as the majority of people and companies didn't want to commit the time or resources to train on a new keyboard if the improvement was only marginal at best. And since then, not much has changed on that front. That said, proponents of the Dvorak keyboard who accept that the Dvorak isn't actually noticeably faster do point out there are other benefits to the Dvorak beyond speed, primarily in less wrist and finger fatigue and supposedly fewer typos, though the data on this latter one is mixed despite widespread claims. While less finger and wrist fatigue does indeed appear to be a genuine benefit, proponents of just sticking with the QWERTY tend to be quick to point out that it takes a rather long time to master a new keyboard layout, with people who've made the switch to Dvorak generally claiming it took them about one to six months to reach the proficiency they had on the QWERTY. And further, it takes an awful lot of continual typing before most find themselves fatigued on the QWERTY layout anyway. Thus, for the majority of people, it's probably not worth the effort of retraining. Further, QWERTY disciples point out that losing proficiency in the QWERTY layout that's pretty much everywhere is potentially an issue of making the switch. Though to that, many people we read who did become proficient on the Dvorak noted that for them, their brains had no issue switching back and forth between the layouts so long as they continued to regularly use both. The human brain is pretty amazing, it turns out. Perhaps the bigger issue for these individuals was that a lot of shortcut keystrokes in various software are geared towards the QWERTY layout and can often be quite awkward on the Dvorak keyboard, though there are ways around this if one wants in some cases, with some auto hotkey scripts that convert for you. A similar issue is often pointed out by computer programmers in that the symbol placement on the Dvorak is extremely suboptimal when programming in C and its many offshoots. Proponents of the Dvorak, however, correctly point out that all of these problems are only problems because almost everyone uses the QWERTY. If everyone switched, you'd get a very tiny boost in speed, slightly less finger and wrist fatigue, and these other problems would go away. But of course, as it's only a slight improvement and not a game-changing one, the QWERTY keyboard, much like the useless letters Q, X, and C, persevere through today and seemingly will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Though there are some new efforts being made for better keyboard layouts when typing with just two thumbs, as people do a huge percentage of the time now. But even then, the QWERTY still dominates to date. As Dr. Dvorak himself aptly summed up, changing the keyboard format is like proposing to reverse the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule, discard every moral principle and ridicule motherhood. Speaking of discarding moral principles, the invention of the chainsaw, which was not originally used for cutting down trees, but much, much more gruesome uses, more akin to Leatherface on Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You can learn all about this in our video here.